And great. Allow me to uh, introduce uh, Bob Turner. I think uh, Bob needs no introduction to many of us. He is, of course, a retired social anthropologist interested in ethnographic field work. <laughs> I believe. Thank you. <laughs> Luckily for us, uh, he was apparently sitting in a fishing village one day uh, reading Scientific American on uh, SPECT imaging of blood flow in the brain when he decided that that might be a good way to do ethnographic, uh, I guess not field work, but anthropology. And uh, so uh, he, uh, I think, uh, switched to that and uh, finding uh, the imaging infrastructure at the time somewhat lacking. Uh, he went down a, the very natural path of working on gradient design and echoplanar imaging. And then at the NIH ultimately performed uh, the cat oxygenation studies that were the precursor to the uh, fMRI studies as we know it. And uh, I sort of call those, he's sort of patient zero for uh, fMRI in that respect. And uh, he spent a good part of his career at the University College London, and then more recently as a director at the MPI uh, in Leipzig, where he gave his department the title Neurophysics, which I think perfectly uh, summarizes things. Thank, Thank you, Bob. You. Thank you very much for the introduction, Larry. Uh, it's very nice. And uh, thanks very much for the, in the invitation to come to talk here. It means quite a lot to me because of my <sighs> longstanding interaction with this wonderful lab at, at NGH. <coughs> But this week it also means quite a lot because my scanner, my seven Tesla scanner in Leipzig is finally being closed down after the 12 years of operation which it actually had starting in 2007 when I first got there. Now, uh, I was handed this seven Tesla on a plate. Not many people get this opportunity. But when I got it, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with it. And that, and that was high resolution structure and function in the human brain. <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk about now is some of the things which I've learned during those seven years that I was at NIH and since, uh, and try to give pointers to what I think should be coming next in terms of human brain science. I would like to leave you fully convinced that Seven Tesla and up is going to be the only way that we can make progress in human systems neuroscience. So um, with that, uh, uh, I'm going to make the first, initially six main points. That neuroanatomy is not random. Neurons are there to connect. The Cahal hypothesis. <coughs> Cortical and anatomical detail has functional importance. And both are available in living human brain with 70 plus MRI. The connections between neuroanatomical components determine their function. <clears throat> when it comes to explaining how something like a brain works, explanations for cognitive actions must be mechanistic. They can be deterministic or probabilistic, but they must be causal. <clears throat> not to, not to, um, <clears throat> just correlations. <clears throat> the third point, every human brain is different. Mechanistic modeling must be tested with individual parcellated living brains. Otherwise, it's just fuzz, it's blobs. It's, it's blobology, it's ne neophrenology. <clears throat> 70 plus MRI is the only in vivo imaging modality that gives mesoscale submillimeter neuroanatomy. And here I follow what Peter Bandettini was saying, and it reveals only myel and ion anatomy. <clears throat> and if we want more details of how the brain looks, we have to get it from cadaver brain histology. So there has to be a close partnership between histology and uh, MRI, as exists in my former lab in Leipzig under the leadership now of Nick Weisskopf. <clears throat> Next point, Milo architecture is accessible in vivo, but you have to contour the cortex correctly in order to be able to uh, make quant quantitative measurements on it. 
it provides the key for comparing brains across individuals and its distribution may classify important cortical microcircuits. And this touches on what Hans Freitag was saying. We need to know about the microcircuits. <coughs> Causal directionality is required for mechanistic modeling and may be obtained as Peter Bandettini was just showing from layer dependent functional MRI mapping. <coughs> so here's what a particular section of the brain looks like. This is a myelin basic protein stain with Brodmann area four on one side and Brodmann area three B on the other side. Now look at all that detail. Why do the myelin fibers stretch so far into the depths, into the, the, the cortex, so almost in, end up in layer one, <coughs> as compared with Brodmann area 3b, where they don't stretch so far. Why are there bands of Biage in area 3b and not in, noticeably in area four? These questions are obvious questions to a physicist like myself, but neuroanatomists for some reason have explored them very little. <coughs> so, I'm going to carry on, pointing out that cerebral cortex is organized into cortical areas of generally well-defined boundaries. They're modular, and there's a very recent paper in Nature by Harris et al, with consistent internal patterns of myelination. The cortex has well-defined input and output layers specific to the cortical area. They differ in different cortical areas, but there's this general theme. The process of myelination is largely bootstrapped by neural experience. The myelin gets there because we use our neurons. It casts neural circuits in stone, pretty much, with some fine tuning available. <clears throat> the traffic of action potentials facilitates increased traffic. So this raises the question, does a specific pattern of myelination, the myeloarchitecture in each cortical area, reveal the principal cortical microcircuits required for the function of that area. Is this an incredible um, <clears throat> um, smoking gun as to how each part of the cortex actually works just by looking at the Milo architecture? This question doesn't get raised and it should be raised. If it is uh, that, then the sequence of myelination of specific brain areas can suggest models of the stages of cognitive development. And I have written about this in Frontiers and Neural Circuits this year. <clears throat> At 7 Tesla, quantitative imaging mapping of T1 by MRI can provide detailed myelin information. And as we've just seen from Peter Bandettini, it can distinguish input and output cortical layers using fMRI. Combining submillimeter structural and functional maps of cortex should give deeper insights into cortical microcircuits the engines of thought. <coughs> so, <clears throat> now let's ask ourselves, what does, why, why do we have myelin? Obviously some axons remain unmyelinated into adulthood, but you could generally say that the myelination of an axon is a sign of its maturity. <coughs> has the following five relevant properties. It accelerates the propagation of action potentials. It decreases the energy cost of transmission by orders of magnitude. It makes axons stronger. It reduces electrical crosstalk. And this is perhaps the most important use of myelin in the cortex, and that is that it reduces synaptic plasticity. It actually inhibits neurite growth and it <coughs> makes axons unavailable for new synapses to form. So, again, the point is reverse engineering analysis of myeloarchitecture may help to explain the structure function relationship of cortical area. <coughs> if anyone's interested in this concept of um, nervous system plasticity depending on myelination, there's an extremely good review by um, Douglas fields published in Nature Reviews in Neuroscience. So this, um, this gives you a, a, a very nice introduction as to how the myelin gets it where it 
where it's, it's going. <coughs> and um, <coughs> how it's formed by uh, oligodendrocytes and um, how the thickness of the myelin sheath can actually be modulated, driven by the neural experience. Here's another nice um, picture of uh, um, the Milo architecture. Can anyone tell me what this area is defined by this uh, layer? Well, everyone should know that it's the primary visual cortex V1 and that's the sphere of Gennari. If you try to find in the literature, uh, why we have a stria of genari, what its functional role is, even though it's well conserved uh, through evolution, at least in primates, <clears throat> you find um, very little even in the way of speculation as to what it does. <clears throat> Here's a macaque brain. There's a stria of genari again. Notice how varied the Milo architecture is and how easy it is to draw boundaries between the different areas. <clears throat> so, when we look at these myelin stain sections, we see that uh, there are basically two types of direction that they fall in. Either they're radial or they're tangential. <clears throat> well, let us think of them as privileged because they're myelinated. Radial fibers extend to specific cortical layers dependent on cortical area. And there are three classical types of tangential fibers. And U fibers, which are just inside the white matter, which are noticeably coherent in direction, they're often late myelinated in a temporal sequence, area by area, <coughs> or shall I say, set of U fibers by set of U fibers. And then there's a bands of Biaget in the layers two and four of the cortex, which characterize cortical areas, and they're probably incoherent in direction, and they terminate at cortical area boundaries. And then there's the exodus stripe, which is universally in layer one of the cortex, and that's probably coherent in direction. <coughs> Recent paper by Micheva shows that intracortical tangential myelinated fibers are mostly inhibitory, and they arise from basket cells. <coughs> They're typically not collaterals of pyramidal cells. In fact, really still, people have very little idea of why we have them and why they were myelinated. And we know very little about whether the other tangential connections in layer one and in the U fibers are inhibitory or excitatory. There's a huge amount to be known about this, but given the fact that these are the efficient axons, they're fast, they're protected, and they're privileged, we ought to know a whole lot more about them. So here are the basket cells which give these axons which um, are horizontal or tangential are going from one part of the cortical area to another part of the cortical area as shown in the, the sketch by Vocht here and this is a, a micrograph at a higher resolution from my lab in Leipzig where you can again see the bands of Biagé defined by the horizontal fibers. <clears throat> so once we do T1 mapping, which is a very good guide to the presence of myelin, and we look at the cortex as we did in 2009-2010 in Leipzig, <clears throat> we find that we can pick out the major <clears throat> cortical areas such as M1 and S1 and primary auditory cortex and V1 and V5 MT simply by the increase in myelin in the cortex. This is an inflated brain. This is worked by Marcel Weiss in my lab. Um, and this match is very nicely worked done by Hopp, uh, where he's, he essentially crudely sketched by with a pencil how much myelin there appeared to be in different areas from the cadaver brain. <coughs> and it was replicated a year or so later by 
Matt Glasser and David Venice in Arte So, my poster at HBM in 2010. <clears throat> so, um, from that, we've gone on to make cortical maps of T1. This is maps of T1 for a single normal volume. And we can now, at seven tests, so we can do this at different depths in the cortex. These are equivolume contours. This has now become the standard way of contouring the cortex developed by Miriam Venice in my lab in Leipzig. <clears throat> and these are created from a half millimeter whole brain maps of T1 contained at 70 radium T wave sequence. And so we can look at the, the map at different depths and pick out Rodman areas from these maps. And we can use these maps to register brains across subjects. This is being done by Christine Tardy, who's now MNI in Montreal. And um, if you use um, such maps to drive the surface registration, this is across 10 subjects, you get really high signal to noise, very sharp um, registry of cortical areas across subjects. And uh, <clears throat> there's still much, much, a uh, huge amount of work to be done in this area, and I, I wish more people were doing it. Even back in 2008, we were getting at seven tests a very nice um, um, that, uh, visualization of the sphere of Genari. Uh, we did a study of blind subjects using the in, uh, inversion recovery turbo spin epic sequence, showing that that um, blind subjects, congenitally blind subjects, have just as pronounced the sphere of genari as normally sighted subjects. But we can go on, and there are much better ways coming up of actually mapping T1 as an index of myelin, very high resolution, 70. And this is one which I've been developing with uh, Rosen Sanchez and uh, Susan Francis at uh, University of Nottingham at 70 on a Phillips scanner. Uh, which uses a multi-shot inversion recovery EPI multi-slice and simultaneous multi-slice. Um, so it's a highly segmented EPI sequence. It's very efficient because you're acquiring data the whole time with 90 degree pulses. So there's no dead time in the sequence. And it produces, here's a picture of the sequence. Here are the segments. So you're acquiring like heck um, slices and segments uh, after a given non-selective non adiabatic inversion. And um, the image quality, as you can see, when you put these together, uh, these are, each image is made up of the EPI with lots of segments. They're really sharp, no artifacts. And you can get very clean T1 maps. And when you do this, you find that the point spread function, as indicated here by a transect of this resolution phantom, the point spread function of this new sequence is a lot better than MP2 rage, which has a rather fuzzy point spread function as between gray and white matter. <clears throat> so that's um, ongoing work, and I would love more people to get involved in this game. What is the best possible signal to noise and point spread function you can get with MRI between gray and white matter? Because visualizing the cortical microstructure, the, the Milo architecture, is really important for neuroscience. <clears throat> because it tells you exactly where you are. <clears throat> So um, there is increasing work now going on in, in terms of looking at the sequential myelination of cortical areas, which tells us a lot about cognitive development, in my view. So there's work, early work by Brody in, in Kinney with, in cadaver brain of infants and neonates, showing that there are wide area-specific variations in the onset of myelination in short association fibers, that's to say U fibers. Now there's work by Yakeman and Wandel a few years ago showing that T1 varies between white matter fascicles. 
and each fascicle has a distinguishable longitudinal time course over the lifespan. Very recent work by Royer et al. Uh, has a title, Myeloarchitecture Gradients in the Human Insula Serve as Blueprints for its Diverse Connectivity and Function. It would be lovely to see how these, how these gradients change during maturation in an area as important as the insula for emotion and, and mental health. And a lovely review article by Mountain Munji, Wrap to Adapt Experience Dependent Myelination. And then more recently, Levenberg et al. from Paris, um, mapping the asynchrony of cortical maturation in the infant brain, an MRI multiparametric multi clustering approach. And they see progressive maturation of primary sensory motor areas, adjacent unimodal associative cortices, and higher order associative areas. But they don't go into detail on any of these. They don't try to identify the neuroanatomy in these children's brains. They don't seem to know much neuroanatomy, even though the neuroanatomy is there to be known. And there's a huge amount of work that can be done in actually tracking how areas myelinate in regard to acquisition of skills and milestones in, in child development, and even learning to read. <coughs> so, a few final slides. Um, in vivo cortical parcellation relevance to fMRI, it's the only known way to correlate cortical structure and function in vivo. It allows the attribution of cortical competence area by area for individual subjects. It's only possible with MRI and high field is vital. We still don't have a concordance atlas between cortical cyto and myeloarchitecture, even though people were doing high quality cytoarchitecture and high quality myeloarchitecture a century ago, we still don't have a concordance atlas. It's shameful. We should use such a map to locate functional activity unambiguously, enabling honest comparison across subjects. And so far I would say that, that it's not been often very honest the way that comparison across subjects has been done. <clears throat> To average across brains, we should use ROIs defined by intracortical anatomy. Should use mean surface registered T1 maps as a template brain. And um, then, of course, that's, a, that's the anatomy, but let's talk about the function. And I'll go through this very quickly because Peter already described this quite nicely. But this goes back to work that uh, I did with Robert Trample in. 2011, before Renzo Huber even arrived in my lab in Leipzig. <clears throat> For each cortical area, prior neuroanatomical knowledge of neural circuitry is often available. Histology and invasive animal studies define the cortical layer specificity of input and output pathways. Activity and input layers can be driven by experimental conditions. Behavioral effects of activity and output layers can be experimentally observed. So we have those tied down. When fMRI spatial resolution can discriminate input and output cortical layers, causal relationships between brain areas may be empirically validated. Causal direction may also be established when the input layers of top-down and bottom-up afferents are spatially separated, as we saw in the final slides in uh, Peter Manatini's talk. <clears throat> and there are lots of different paradigms which you can gain insight into how the brain is actually wired up. Motor imagery versus actual motion, visual imagery versus actual vision, auditory imagery versus actual hearing, and so forth. A long list. Some of these have already been explored experimentally, others haven't. This was the one that we showed at several conferences in 2011. We used the comparison of finger tapping or imagined finger tapping, and found that in the case of imagined finger tapping, the, um, <clears throat> the output layer of the cortex, uh, layer five, in the case of motor cortex, seems to be activated quite a lot less than in the act active conditions of tapping or moving the finger. And um, so this really was the the first indication that this layer dependent 
uh, fMRI, this is bold fMRI, actually could tell us something about um, how the, uh, the, the microcircuitry was actually organized. <clears throat> Since then, of course, there have been quite a number of studies. This is one recently uh, presented in uh, bioarchive by Remy Go et al, done also in Leipzig, which compared um, a, a cross modal activation and changes in attention. And we find that um, combining laminar and multivariate pattern analyses that demonstrates that multisensory and attentional influences emerge in auditory cortices with di distinct laminar profiles and in visual cortices with distinct activation patterns. So thus, cross modal and attentional influences in early sensory cortices may rely on partly distinct neural mechanisms. So these are the kind of questions we can start to address using layer dependent activity with very firm anatomical identification of these areas via their myelin. But of course, as um, Peter was saying, cerebral blood volume gives us better characterization of layer dependent activity. And there's good reasons why this might be the case. That um, capillaries do actually change their cerebral blood volume. And it turns out that it's because they're so porous, they can do that. <clears throat> cerebral blood volume seems to be more tightly localized than bold. The mechanism is apparently mostly controlled by pericytes, according to David Atwell's lab in London, published in a number of papers. They claim that capillaries dilate before arterioles estimated to produce 84% of the blood flow increase. The parasites envelop the capillaries all the way along the length. Here's the parasites in green. So they're in a great position to make control all the way along. Um, the control of blood oxygenation is obviously much more non-localized. And uh, this um, general finding was shown by um, Tonji King's lab uh, uh, years ago in 2006 using the blood pool contrast agent. Uh, this is the uh, second time we've seen this slide, showing us that Veta does a better job of specificity, combined specificity and sensitivity than maybe the echo bold or spin echo bold. And uh, you've seen this slide and I don't need to go through it. So how can such information be incorporated in realistic brain models? I've written about this in a paper published in 2016. We need a radical paradigm shift. We need to eradicate obsolete analysis techniques that fail to respect the physical characteristics of the brain. We should not be smoothing fMRI data. We should use crossing fiber diffusion MRI tractography. We can improve localization in single subjects using objective cortical parcellation using Milo architecture. We should use subcortical parcellation using iron and myelin maps. Based cerebral blood volume mapping gives much better match to neural activity. We should model functional brain mechanisms causally based on identifiable mesoscale structure and layer dependent activity. And that was my lab in 2010 in front of our seven Tesla scanner building. And um, sad that I no longer have a lab, but it was great fun when I did. And I want to thank Siemens for their fantastic support of my lab in Leipzig over those years. And um, that was my research team in 2012. And particularly important were Robert Trample, Stephen Geyer, Gabriella Lohman, and Mikhail Koslov. Uh, but we uh, published a lot of papers in those years. It was really good fun. And oh, seven Tesla is such a joy. Thank you very much for your attention.